Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Hello, Jeanette. Hello, Miranda. Uh, I hope you can hear me OK. Um, if not, uh, please let me know on, on the chat. Uh, connection wise, we will be OK. So the way uh, we will do this is to, you know, take it informally, uh, have a conversation with both Jeanette and, and Miranda. Uh, uh, Jeanette, uh, had you know uh, she she published an article with us in the in the comics grid about fun home and uh, Paula will be sharing the links on the chat or she has already done so and Miranda did publish an article about um, uh, uh, um, <laughs> I just froze uh, I have the book right here through through the woods uh, uh, so, you know, I found the, the, both articles, even though they are completely unrelated in terms of how they were processed and well admitted, et cetera, uh, the peer reviewers, it, you know, it was all different. Uh, I found interesting connections that I would like to, uh, you know, be able to discuss with them and with you today. Uh, Janet uh, is an independent scholar. Uh, she gained her PhD at the University of South Wales Atrium in Cardiff. Uh, she's interested in performance and theater studies, adaptation and transmedia, intersectional feminism, the canon and popular culture, and the Gothic. So uh, we see the connections there as well, as we will see with uh, with Miranda, who is a lecturer in 21st century literature at the university at University College Cork in Ireland, and her research interests include popular fiction, sci-fi, horror, and the Gothic. Uh, they are both on Twitter. Um, the information is on the on the announcement, so I will probably can probably share that um, on the on the link. And I hope this will reach everyone. Uh, so I would like to start. If, um, uh, oh yes, and a reminder that this is being recorded. We will share it tomorrow. And if you have questions, members, uh, if you can type your questions, uh, please, and we will be. Uh, having them at the at the end after the initial conversation with them so so I, I'll, I'll ask a question for both uh, Jeanette and Miranda and maybe Jeanette can go first and then and then Miranda about it and it's really general about the motivation that you had for uh, for your articles uh, what, what how did you find the the books to to write about uh, what's your story your relationship with these texts and um, how did you go about yeah, deciding that it was, you know, that you wanted to write an article or uh, or to do research about text slash publications books. Uh, Jeanette, first. Hello, and thank you for having me today. This is marvellous. Um, so in terms of how I came to find a Fun Home and the motivation in writing the article, I was um, in the process of writing a PhD thesis and I was looking for uh, a, a third case study essentially and uh, what I think might be quite interesting in terms of the uh, way in which my article discusses like the order in which we come across texts and things like that um, I actually came across the stage production first and saw in the advertising that it was based on uh, a graphic novel and despite me having quite a keen interest in comics and comic studies, I somehow had not come across Fun Home before um, and read it, absolutely really loved it, um, really enjoyed reading everything attached to it um, and then went to see the stage show as well. And it um, sort of represented a really interesting kind of meeting point of a lot of my research interests to do with um, feminism, canon um, and performance and adaptation and spectatorship that um, kind of coalesced very neatly in that um, stage adaptation of, of Fun Home. Uh, hopefully that's that's enough of an answer. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, in Yes, it is indeed. Thank you, Janet. Miranda, uh, how did it? How was it for you in terms of the discovery of uh, through the woods? Um, actually, yeah, yeah. I think my my thank, thank you. I think it was worth saying anything else. else. Thank you for having me here and being part of this discussion. Um, a 
little bit like the neck. It was perhaps a little bit random and a little bit tangential to my research. Um, I, I just happened across a book um, in Waterstones one day about two years ago. And I'm particularly interested in, in fairy tales and in horror and in the relationship between those two forms. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if the, if the audio uh, is distorted when I speak or was that earlier. I kind of noticed the, the chat pop up. Can people hear me? It's distorted, uh, uh, Miranda. I don't know if maybe. Yeah. Him oh, no, I'm Okay, can you hear me now? I think there is some feedback, so it might be an issue with the volume on your speakers, maybe, or I don't know if Paula can. Uh, oh, okay. Um, it wasn't like that earlier. Hang on two seconds. Um, um, let me see if. Um, I'm going to try turning maybe the volume down. down a little bit. Is, is, it, is it any better now or worse? It's worse. So maybe can you, don't worry, it's fine. Can you to leave and come back again and maybe if you switch on again? And I would suggest try lowering the volume of your speakers because you're not wearing headphones, so it may be that. Um, okay. But it's fine. Don't, don't worry. We, we will mingle. Uh, Carry on. Um, all right. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, should we uh, go back to Jeanette while while Miranda uh, returns? Can you guys hear me? Okay, or am I also coming out distorted? Okay. Thank you, uh, Jeanette. So what's interesting is that I was I was I was asking you about <laughs> about the book, but uh, as Martin also co contributed on the chat, it was a transmedia discovery, right? Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were talking about the musical as well and and and, and theater. I think Miranda is back, but, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that performative aspect of the discovery. Miranda, are you are you back with us? Well, I don't think she has. Yes. No. Okay. So, Janet, while while Miranda joins us, uh, would you like to comment on this on this aspect of the of the of the transmedia element of the of the you know theater component was it through that part of things that you got interested in von home uh, well uh, this was something that i sort of talked about because the the article was originally a paper as well um and it's something i spoke about in the paper was that when i first presented on it i hadn't actually seen the stage play <laughs> um but i had already kind of uh, encountered all its myriad forms online so I felt like I had a swearing on the on the play anyway um, and something that I think is quite um, helpful coming from a performance background is that you're quite often dealing with texts that you've either ever seen in performance or you can only encounter through photographs or through descriptions and reviews and things like that so I think there's perhaps a um, a kind of ease of dealing with that sort of material that comes from a performance studies perspective uh, that's quite interesting in that transmedia sense of, um, of a kind of knowledge of where a text begins and ends, what your experience of that is, um, that you sort of not comfortable because everybody always feels a bit uncomfortable. There's a bit of comfort in dealing with texts that are kind of beyond those boundaries of something that's very closed uh, when you're dealing with performance uh, and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, it was interesting because I came through it via the via the adverts for the performance, really, rather than the performance right. itself as well, <laughs> and then discovered right. the graphic novel and then the performance. So a very yeah, medial discovery. <laughs> Sure, I read, I read that lots of people discovered Fun Home through the reviews in the New Yorker, for instance, of the mm. or the theater adaptation, and then you know how things feed back in a very interesting way. That it's probably not the one that you would expect if you first came across mm. it as a comic, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so we. Uh, to continue the, the 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 order of the of the questions, uh, let's see if Miranda can uh, come back now. We were talking about how your process of discovery of this book, uh, if it was um, through the book or maybe yeah. 
Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Lovely. Oh, thank God. Okay, good, good. That means I don't have to reboot the computer or do any more fidgeting. Um, so I guess just back to my or the original question that I was asked, um, the, the book itself wasn't initially a part of my research. I just happened to cross it in Waterstones one day. And immediately upon seeing it, it appealed to me. Because if, you, if you've seen the cover or seen the artwork, uh, hang on a second there. I have an image I will actually show to you there. Um, share application, home tab. OK, and I will, it's this one. Yes, it is. Um, if you can see the image here, uh, this is the title page of the comic um, or of the book. And it really appealed to me upon seeing it because obviously it has this wonderful fairy tale iconography. And the story itself or the stories, it's a collection of um, short stories, are all adaptations or reworkings of fairy tales. So this initially appealed to me because I'm a big fan of both horror and fairy tales. And this book really intermingles the two in a fascinating way. Um, so um, it's something that initially grabbed me straight away upon seeing it in the bookshop. And initially what I decided I would do is that I would include it on one of my one of my syllabi for the year. For the forthcoming year, I was teaching on a course called Contemporary Literature and Culture. And I thought, oh, well, this would be a really, really interesting work to include because, again, it adapts and plays with fairy tales. Um, the visuals are really, really interesting. It incorporates aspects of the Gothic, particularly the female Gothic. Um, so I thought it would be an interesting work to teach. Um, and also I thought it would be an interesting way to get students acquainted with comics and graphic narratives. And then kind of the more I started to think about it and the more I started engaging with the text, I became really fascinated by how its form and how the visual components of the text sort of reinforce some of the thematic concerns. So eventually I decided, well, I, I really need to write something on this because it's such an engaging work. But because it's so new, there's very little out there um, on it at the moment. So I guess that's a, an overview of how I came to the text. Right, so it it's interesting because uh, yeah, the the discovery through visuals uh, again, <laughs> I am now biased by by Martin's uh, commentary on the chat. Uh, he called the you know, as he he says the serendipity of visual appeal here, and indeed, I mean, it's uh, Janet talked about getting interested in in fun home through the publicity uh, of the of the performance of the adaptation. Uh, Jeanette, would would you like to elaborate on this and how that led you to, you know, choosing or, you know, how did you come to uh, find a way of, of reading this multimedia text or, or identifying? Is that how you thought of it? Part of, uh, because that's not necessarily your terminology, multimedia. But uh, were you, um, you know, what was your the the the, the framework that you had, or uh, how did it come to be? How did you read these two texts, and how did you come to think what you th describe in your article about it? Um, I think again, I think that word serendipity is a really nice one to kind of plunge into this one, um, because. Um, my methodology is always mainly reading, uh, reading, reading, reading. So um, having found the stage show and have found um, the graphic novel, I then set about reading everything I could about it. And um, that then absolutely sort of crystallized this sense of um, Fun Home as itself a discussion of canonicity and the place of um, that graphic novel within that sort of current discussion about a comic canon, and whether there is one and whether there should be one, and and how comic studies was um, kind of developing as a field and those sorts of things, um, and then looking at how that related to the position of uh, the musical as well within those kinds of structures in performance, and how those things appeared to be replicating through all the different texts that you encounter, um, 
was really interesting to me in terms of those kind of um, sometimes deliberate and sometimes not so deliberate constructions of legitimacy, constructions of canon and how those things were kind of culturally replicating throughout everything I um, discovered about the, the text really. And uh, in, in, in this sense, um, how, you know, your, your apparatus, how much did you think you had to know about, about comics, the you know, critical approaches to comics to, to approach either text or both texts? Or do you think it would have been possible to approach them without even looking at that? Uh, do you think we are at a moment in which that's totally a thing, it's always been a thing, or, or did you have to go and find out, uh, you know, like the, the Hillary shoots, uh, you know, the people that had been writing about Funko before? Were you guided by this? I think my, that's a tricky one, because I think although you can comment upon uh, comics without that background, you will be missing something, um, particularly in an academic sense where, you know, those sorts of understandings of a field can contextualise your work in particular ways. Um, so although comic studies is, I think, inherently disciplinary and you can come at comics from a variety of different standpoints, um, I think it's also quite imperative that you're paying attention to comic studies itself and, and what is being said there and how that contextualise some of the things that you're trying to, to put across as well. Could you, could you give us an example before I go back to uh, to, to Miranda uh, 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 in the same I, sense, I think, but an example of... Yeah. yeah, I think particularly for me, uh, the kind of feminist readings of comics and, and looking at um, particularly that concept of canonization and the idea that there have been several um, sort of forays into things like Cambridge Companion, things like um, other kind of legitimized type academic texts um, and criticisms of that coming from feminist comic scholars uh, and kind of looking at the idea that even though it's apparently a burgeoning a new field there's still a kind of sense of we have to already correct kind of historicizing that is ignoring um, marginalized creators uh, so, so I think kind of looking at what people are saying within the field uh, while you're looking at this one text this one case study um, ha helps to contextualise your work. It's not necessarily um, like crucial that you have to do it. It certainly creates that context more. Mm. So what's know. very interesting in terms of you know the formation of canons and uh, von Home plays a particular role there. I think recently, and and perhaps uh, going back to Miranda now, could you could you address this uh, this question Miranda of uh, your sources or the the specificity of comic studies you start with Scott McCloud and the, the the concept of of bleeding and you know, the space between panels etc and there's something else as well about through the woods uh, that refer to it to the cover it's actually I realize it's a bit different to my edition uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah it, it looks a bit like uh, I would say canonical picture books or you know the fairy tale components. So there's also something there about the canon uh, across genres or across narrative types. Um, how did you navigate all these 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 issues? Because there's also feminist theory involved there, or or you know women specific topics, I suppose, uh, with the, the issue of bleeding and uh, you know how did how did you reconcile uh, all those different approaches uh, in your work? Um, so, a lot of my my research at the moment um, for some of my other projects focuses on sort of questions of, you know, uh, corporeal feminism and questions of embodiment, and in particular, this idea that uh, crops up a lot in the study of horror fiction, the Gothic, uh, about how women's bodies while, um, tend to be viewed as sort of porous and leaky and undifferentiated from the world. So there's this idea that, uh, yeah, that women's bodies are 
are leaky, that uh, they are prone to sort of eruptions and unstable in a way that men's bodies aren't. Um, and I find that really, really interesting, in particular how it's portrayed in horror fiction. And as I was reading and preparing to teach through the woods, I started looking at some of the formal components of the comic. And I guess one of the things that's so interesting about comics is that there is so much going on in them. There's so much going on in every single page. Um, and one and I was thinking about the comic as a sort of multimodal form, as in it's a form that encompasses multiple modes, multiple ways that we can read and understand what's happening. So obviously you have the, the narrative itself and you have the visuals and you need to sort of engage with both in order to understand the story. But there's more than that. With comics, you also need to be able to, to read the typography. You know, how are certain words presented? How are they written? You need to be able to read emanate, you know, the little symbols that you sometimes get to, um, to signify emotions or how a character is feeling. Um, you need to be able to kind of understand um, how the images are spaced on the page. Uh, you need to be able to read the layout. You need to be able to uh, understand why images are, some images are separated, some images are combined. Uh, so I was thinking more and more about this. And one thing that really caught my eye about Through the Woods is that Carol tends to use a lot of bleeds. And a bleed is a printing term, and I'm, I'm sure most of you guys know this, but a bleed is a printing term that refers to an image that isn't contained by the borders of the page. Uh, there isn't a border separating it from the edge of the page. It just seems to sort of seep or bleed off the edge of the page. And it really intrigued me that this comic that is so preoccupied with women and women's bodies, and in particular questions of maturity and sexuality, would frequently use these bleeds. So the uncontainability of the image in the comic starts to sort of reflect the thematic concern with the supposed uncontainability of the female body. And I was just really, really intrigued by the sort of possibility for you know linguistic play um, in that notion of the, the visual bleed on the page and the thematic bleed in terms of how the text represents female bodies and how it has this ongoing preoccupation with women's bodies and sexuality and how they're framed by their cultures. So it was just, that was particularly intriguing to me. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, fascinating uh, the, reading the book. And I happily say, you know, book, because not only because I read it on print and, it, you know, the paper, uh, I don't know if all of you guys have read it or or just seen it or touched it, but it's quite heavy and glossy mm -hmm. and uh, the 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 very the, the black is the blank the black ink is very black and mm -hmm. sort of uh, you know if you have the right lighting you can see yourself reading it. Yeah. It gives <laughs> uh, it like there's um, a real sense of texture there, I think, which is which is really yeah. nice. It's a very tangible book. Like I would recommend anyone who's going to read it go out and get a physical copy because you're right it is heavy it's glossy it feels almost um as you mentioned earlier a little bit like a children's book as well it feels like a a children's co collection of fairy tales of course until you get to some of the the nastier images but um there is that kind of sense of materiality that you get with children's books and it's it's a very nice book to have a physical copy of yeah i, I would say fun home uh he shares some of that, even though it's a black and white comic, right? You've read the fun home, um, uh, Miranda. I have. Well. I actually, I taught it a few years ago and okay. absolutely it does have that kind of materiality. And I remember the first time I read it, I got really excited when Bechdel mentioned the Adams family, uh, not just because I'm, I'm a fan of those cartoons, but because the book itself reminded me of, you know, Charles Adams style of, of drawing. Um, and it reminded me of like looking through those comics. Um, so yeah, that's, um, so yeah, I, I've read it as well. And there's there's definitely that sense, it might not be in color, but there's a sense that it's a wonderfully material text because there's so much going on in every panel. It's nice just to sit down and look at it. Yeah. Was it like a, 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 a similar experience for you, uh, Janet, in terms of the material 
characteristics of the of the of fun home or or of the yeah, or the black yeah. and white and yeah yeah and I, in particular I really love the um the visuals of books it's such a kind of self referential reading text that there's these constantly pictures of books everywhere and like piles yeah. of of texts where where you can spend ages just looking at what you know what all the spines say and and thinking about which ones you've read and which you haven't and things like that and that the sort of visuals of those are really interesting and I think the way um, from what Miranda was saying about the ways in which form kind of mimics uh, thematic context so the kind of the circularity of it that it's constantly returning to very similar images um, and it, it's kind of thematic concerns with memory and with autobiography and with perspective and you keep getting these kind of repeated images but from slightly different perspectives or slightly wider framing and things like that um, and the kind of representations of of as yes something to be read but also a, a kind of visual a kind of sham because it's part of the house that bruce has built in order to make this respectable family life and part of that is is this kind of wall of us that's constantly being um visualized and framed and then revealed to be a kind of facade it is really interesting yeah do you feel there's um i mean i mean i'm approaching now the the end of my my questioning to let you know questions from uh, the audience as well but uh you know would, would you say i mean i've been really trying to to think about this uh, out loud about the you know that you have in your title this notion of troubling you know troubling the boundaries and the boundaries are of different sorts right uh, yeah. sexuality really uh genre gender <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, have you got uh, a boundary uh, or blur it? Or it is there, right? I mean, <laughs> be, because, I mean, in a way that feels quite seamless, I guess, when one is reading the book or, but it feels quite apparent when one sees, I have not seen the performances, but I've, I've seen videos and the photos and, and I mean, to me as a comics reader, I, I, that's when I felt the otherness of the ad, sort of the adapt um, but you know the the idea of the panel, right? Like the reticularity of the page, the again the comics grid, let's say that you have in Fun Home that you do not necessarily have in in the, through the woods. That over there is the bleed, and it's more like a proximity. I would say maybe Miranda disagrees, but with picture books again, uh, uh, you know, like the, all everything expands and and, and leaks, mm -hmm. and and the boundaries in Fun Home are. Are to be crossed. They are not to be made fluid, perhaps. But there's difficulty in the organization and in theater. Would you say what are the challenges there in in performance? We don't get that, do we? Um, we don't have that rigidity. Is it is of a different kind? Um, no, but there is. Um, uh, looking at form, I think there were quite a few uh, forms that were being specifically referenced by. Um, musical. So, so first of all, uh, ex excuse me, going back to canon again, but that's part of my my study of it. Um, so, looking at kind of canonical Broadway musicals like um, Sunday in the Park with George and things like that are, are quite clearly being referenced. Uh, similarly, things like the Memory Play and Tragedy um, are, are quite clear kind of full concerns of the piece that are. Um, that are part of its structure. Um, so although it perhaps feels more fluid, it is still kind of conforming to quite a few formal boundaries, but it was also a way that very carefully broke those boundaries in places um, and was not any one of those things in particular either. So it, it was a play that very interestingly, again, kind of set up boundaries only to then kind of them and and go beyond them which, which is very um good in terms of kind of formal adaptation as well as a literal adaptation i guess yeah Makes sense. very very interesting <laughs> and with which takes me to gothic and your the interest that you have in the gothic too and i am i i like goth stuff 
but I'm not an expert, so you both will excuse me if I say something that's completely out of order. But is there something about the Gothic that that can be met, you know, that that can help us as a, as a, very specifically as a framework to understand this kind of meta narratives, uh, multi modality of fluidity. Um, uh, that I, I sense that this is a current that it may not be as explicit in your in your work, Janet, in this particular article, but it is Miranda's that the the, the Gothic help you know there's something out it that helps us emphasize the this leakiness and uh you know cross referential border crossing i don't know what i'm saying maybe <laughs> Mira, maybe miranda would like to pick it up here uh, to to wrap up this sure. section before we take questions from the audience but in th that sense like the gothic as a Whatever that is, you know, I'm not sure if I'm talking about Gothic studies, but about but about the Gothic as 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 would you say it helps us? Uh, it it can go beyond the Gothic, beyond books that are considered Gothic literature or, or that would be within the horror genre, to explain this phenomena of multimodality or transition yeah. narrative. Absolutely, definitely. I mean, I, yeah, that's actually a really interesting point, and it's something I probably wanted to talk about a bit more and the article but didn't have like, time or space but I mean the gothic you know as you said there you were you were kind of struggling to kind of define what the gothic was and you know how you would discuss it and what gothic studies are but like one of the most interesting things about the gothic is that it is such a fluid and kind of amorphous form I mean it's some it's a kind of it's a mode of writing that has and not just a mode of writing but a you know a type uh, it's sorry, just noticed the dog comment there. Um, it's a um, it's a mode that has evolved over the centuries and sort of occasionally grafted itself onto other genres, and it is constantly changing and constantly evolving. And yeah, it is a difficult um, literary mode to define. I think that's what's interesting about it. It's quite a nebulous form. But in terms of comics, I think there's a lot of very interesting overlap uh, between comics and the Gothic. And I know Julia Round, for example, has a really interesting book about comics and the Gothic. And she delves into this, you know, in far more detail and with, you know, far more um, scholarly insight than I could. But there's some, you know, she has some really interesting stuff in that where she talks about, you know, the the relationship between comics and the Gothic and the fact that, you know, um, the, the two forms have a lot in common, even where they aren't explicitly meeting. Uh, they have a lot in common in that, you know, comics very much um, are very much defined by excess a lot of the time. You know, you have so much going on in any single page uh, in terms of drawings, in terms of layout and format, text, and the natty, typography. There's always so much going on in every single page. And that kind of excess is the kind, uh, is, a, is of a similar type to the kind that you find in the Gothic. You know, one of the things that differentiates the Gothic both in architecture and literature and art is that it is a very excessive form. So they have that in common. And also, I guess, you know, both comics and the Gothic are modes that have often been seen as perhaps lowbrow, uh, perhaps populist, but also, you know, they've been accused of uh, being corrupting. You know, in the at the end of the 18th century, there's a lot of concern about women reading Gothic novels and the influence that would have on them in much the same way that in the 20th century, you see um, a moral panic about young people reading comics. So there's actually a, a lot going on um, and there are a lot of parallels in terms of Gothic and comics and how they how they overlap and the parallels that exist between them. But on top of that, you also have, um, you know, you have these questions of authenticity and inauthenticity. And I think maybe Jeanette could say more to this with regard to Fun Home. But, you know, with comics, you know, it's possible to present multiple different perspectives and sort of embed narrative in really, really interesting ways, which is, of course, a key feature of the Gothic. You know, so many early Gothic novels are texts that are, you know, framed as 
authentic medieval manuscripts or true stories or they're written in an epistolary form. So there's this kind of um, claim to authenticity and Gothic texts often try to um, to trouble the you know the idea of authenticity and what it means to tell a story from a particular perspective. And I think comics can do that in interesting ways as well. Yeah, Jenny, possibly also like a to... kind of preoccupation with returning and memory and history and those kinds of things um, was one of the things that struck me in um, in Through the Woods was its setting in that very historical kind of look at peace and that sort of thing um, and fun home constant returning and I think that's absolutely right that sort of sense of a search for authenticity and a, a kind of discussion of what it is to be authentic and what autobiography is and what truth is is absolutely at the heart of those sorts of discussions that, that take place in, in the graphic novel definitely and, and there's the I, I said I would shut up now but <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about yeah the, the, it's nice that you know the ghost of the father of the male figure in both books um, is interesting there's that well fun home is haunted by the father's suicide and yeah, sorry if it, this is a bad spoiler <laughs> but um, it is I mean maybe that's a way of saying it and, and mm. through the woods like many fairy days and and the references yeah, like in, to in that sense of perspective yeah it's something that um, I interviewed Lisa Cron about the, the musical and something she said really sort of triggered her understanding of the text was this sense that um, nothing actually happens in it because it's all just memory but what makes it dramatic is that you know the ending already because you know at the yeah. beginning she tells you what's going to happen yeah. so the, yeah. the drama of it is watching those scenes and, and knowing that they have no idea what's coming to them which seems to me quite a kind of gothic idea of perspective that there's this yes. kind of death hanging over the whole thing that you know yeah. is inevitable but you're watching it kind of play out um and seeing when it's when it's going to come and how and that sort of thing so there's a kind of haunting of the entire thing of, of this death yeah, yeah. actually through, through the woods also has that sort of preoccupation with the death of parents uh in a number of the stories parents either vanish or it's already established that they've passed away or they're simply absent um, or you know we just never see them and I think that's really interesting because obviously it's borrowing on a, a fairy tale tradition that is sort of uh, you know um, that is born out of a pre-modern world where you know high maternal mortality rates for example meant that at the time when a lot of the fairy tales that Carol adapts were initially being told you know it was common for people to lose parents and there is recurring theme throughout the stories and through the woods of the absent parents or the vanished parents and it seems to perhaps tie in a little bit with fun home in that sense because of course the absent parent or the loss of the parent is in a way a sort of you know a metaphorical way of dealing with the the larger process of growing up and you know entering into adulthood this idea of you know losing the parent or leaving the parents behind you know entering into the adult world I have so many other things I would like to <laughs> I would like to ask, but uh, is there is there something else you would like to say before we pass to you know we the participants an opportunity to ask you questions? Uh, something else you would like to say, compliment something you feel you haven't had a chance to say yet? No. 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 Okay. Uh, uh, all the questions have been good, so bring on the other questions. Yeah. Excellent, uh, Paula. Uh, over to you. So yeah, if you have people, if, uh, people, <laughs> sorry, participants, dear participants, if you uh, if you have any questions that you would like to share with us uh, uh, here in the chat, and and Paula can relay them to um, to our uh, presenters. You can post your um, questions in the chat, and then I will read them. So if you have any questions, just feel free to post them in the chat. We still have uh, around fifteen minutes in which we can go through the questions. I do have a question, but I'm sure some of the things I'm going to ask now have been previously discussed before. 
But anyway, I'm going to ask it. I have written it, so I'm going to read it. So both articles engage, expand, and transgress the notion of boundaries, whether Janet Dar's exploration of the definitive boundaries between text and paratext, transmedial narrative, or author and characters in Bechdel, Von Hohn, or Miranda Cocor Cocoran, sorry, analysis of Carroll's use of bleed as a means to give form to a mode of horror known as the abject, connected here with the anxieties of growing up. So my question is, how does this play through the main character of the comic? Both kids trying to navigate the anxieties, concerns, and vulnerability that surround the articulation of girls' women identities or the awakening of queer identities during that process of growing up or living childhood behind? And how do the crossing of boundaries play and relate to the process of the, or the trauma of becoming an adult body, a woman body, or a lesbian body in a patriarchal society because I don't know, but for me, the process of growing up of becoming a woman was complicated and a bit traumatic. I was 12 or 13 years old and I didn't want to become a woman. I didn't want to be sexualized. I just wanted to continue being a child because this is how I felt safe. So yeah, for me, it was very interested, interesting how you play with like the boundaries and associate that with, it's like growing up, um, smashing the boundary as well. If you could expand this a little bit more, and although I'm absolutely serious, you have already done that before, but I would like to see like a point of view like, from both of you in relation to the your articles. Um, Who would like to go? Shall I go first since I'm I've already said something now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think something that the, the stage production did was take some of those boundary crossing elements and uh, really run with them as well. Um, because one of the things that's really striking is the song Ring of Keys, which has become a kind of uh, lesbian anthem in some ways. Um, and one of the things that's really striking is that it's performed by a child actor. So it's, it's a... Um, uh, I'm sort of assuming everyone's familiar with, with both texts. Um, the, the graphic novel shows the young Bechdel uh, looking at uh, a, a sort of a woman dressed in a very masculine way in a cafe and thinking, wow, that's kind of what I want to be. And then in the musical, the, the, the child Alison sings this song about the woman that she sees and how she's amazing. And she has this ring of keys and her swagger and her bearing. Um, so there's a sense in which I think those anxieties are are actually made not anxieties. And one of the radical things that the musical does is celebrate those things and say, you know, they, these are modes of anxiety. But why? You know, <laughs> you, 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 when you have that awakening, it should be joyous and it should be a song and it should be amazing. Uh, and as an audience, you, you feel that joy. And the same with the um, with song that comes from her experiences with Joan at university that becomes I'm changing my major to Joan, uh, the song in the musical, that is again uh, this very specifically and deliberately sexual awakening, not a love story, but a, you know, wow, I'm having sex and it's great kind of um, awakening that is joyous. And as an audience, you're invited to share in that joy that is often a marginalised one, but is in fact everybody's joy uh, in that kind of moment of awakening when it happens or if it happens um, and in whatever way it happens you're you're kind of invited into that celebration of it which I think is one of the things that the music does really well and then on the other hand you've got the um, the sort of tragic song of Bechdel's mother which takes what is a, a sort of um, not so fleshed out character in the graphic novel and creates this horribly relatable song about how she kind of disappears in her motherhood into socks and lunches and, and nobody notices when she disappears. So I think the the kind of extensions that you see in the musical really get at the the emotion of the other things in the graphic novel that are dealing with those anxieties uh, and, and kind of make them celebratory uh, or extremely tragic they really nail the emotion of it um, for, for the audience. Miranda. 
Okay. Um, that was actually, that's really interesting because um, actually I, I haven't had a chance to read the, the follow-up. Um, it's called, Are You My Mother? Is that it? Yeah. Um, and I haven't had a chance to read that, but it, it sort of has me has me thinking about that now that the, the musical has has given more of a role to to Bechdel's mother. But that point you made there about that that one song where the where the, her mother sings about disappearing into motherhood actually makes me think a lot of some of the anxieties that the characters engage with, or some of the anxieties that the characters face in Through the Woods, because sort of growing up and becoming a woman is kind of presented as something that is simultaneously like fascinating and engaging, but also frightening, which again is a very sort of gothic way to to present something, you know, that um, that duality of fear and desire. And there is one story called The Nesting Place where the, the main character is is a young girl. She's maybe 12 or 13. And she's, you know, she's a very tomboyish kid. You know, she she wears kind of primarily boyish clothes and she has no interest in like fashion or makeup. And, you know, even though her, her brother sort of tries to encourage her to spend more time with his beautiful, glamorous fiance so that she might learn a little bit about, you know, properly performing femininity, I guess. Um, she's, she's very resistant to all that. And, you know, as the story progresses, we learn that the, the brother's beautiful, glamorous fiance is in fact a sort of monstrous creature comprised of all of these little red worm-like entities. That's going to sound really weird if you haven't read the comic. But, um, and there's this idea or there's this sense that the, the brother's fiance, her name is Rebecca, that she represents a sort of monstrous motherhood, that she represents this idea that uh, as a woman, as you get older, as you and in particular um, through processes like pregnancy and childbirth and motherhood, you end up sort of losing yourself. You know, the character is really just host to all of these strange alien or monstrous organisms. And there's this real fear that sort of growing up, entering into adult sexuality, perhaps becoming a mother, that these things will cause you to lose yourself and to lose your identity and your sense of who you are. So I think there's kind of a similar anxiety there. But at the same time, of course, I think some of the, the stories also present characters who are somewhat fascinated or intrigued by the process of, of growing up and somewhat intrigued and curious to, to explore their sexuality as well. So there's, again, there's a duality there that I think is quite interesting. Thank you so much, Janet and Miranda, for your answers. We will go ahead for, uh, with the next question from Josie Cray, which is for Miranda. And he, uh, she asks, what do you make of Carol's story, His Face All Red, which is the only story really concerned with male characters and your discussion of the gothic, the body? Yeah, that's really interesting. One of the main characters are men compared to the other stories in Through the Woods. Yeah, that, that's really interesting because, yeah, I, I feel like his face all red is something of an outlier because in all of the other stories, um, as you said in your question, all of the, the main characters are women um, and the protagonists are women and we get very much a like a female perspective on everything. And, you know, one reason I think that the story is a bit of an outlier is that it's I think the only story in the collection that wasn't written specifically for that collection, it was originally a web comic. Um, Carol started um, started producing comics online, and his face all red was a a web comic of hers that really took off and became very popular. So I think it was the only one that wasn't written specifically for the collection. So I think tonally and in terms of its characterization, it's it's a little bit different. And I think the fact that its characters are male. Um, is really interesting because it frames their concerns very differently and it frames their fears and their anxieties very differently. So for in the other stories where the characters are women, there's this anxiety about sexuality and about the body, and about what it means to be a woman, about that embodied experience of femininity. But in his face all red, the character's concerns seem to be sort of more material. So it's about a guy who's, you know, incredibly jealous of his his older brother, um, who is, you know, handsome and popular, and he has a bigger farm with more livestock, and he's really successful. Um, and he and 
he ends up murdering the brother and briefly taking possession of his of his you know his farm and his his beautiful wife and um kind of gaining all the popularity his brother had and it's interesting that the story that is about you know the story about men is a lot more focused on kind of social standing and on this idea of kind of expressing you know masculinity through success and through achievement whereas the stories i think that are are more concerned with women's experiences are far more kind of nuanced in their depiction of embodiment and female sexuality and are far more anxious about what it means to be um in this case a woman if that makes sense i don't know if that Thank you. And also this relationship between a woman's sexuality and growing up and vulnerability as well, which is in a certain way, but make it difficult and traumatic. And as Jenna said, we should be celebrating that we are growing up. And then it's hard when we are living in a patriarchal society that sexualizes women when you are only 12 or 13 years old. It's, it's scary in a certain way for a kid. <laughs> At least it really me yeah and i think that's what you know um certainly carol's versions of you know little red riding hood which she adapts or sort of adapts in at least at least two of the stories it focuses on that idea that while or it focuses on a kind of ambivalence about growing up that on the one hand it's you know it's intriguing it's it's something of an adventure but there are always these dangers lurking in the background and this anxiety about the vulnerability of the female body it's always there in the background so in the last story for example in the collection which is just called conclusion it has this little red riding hood style character making her way through the forest and you know she stops off and she kind of you know she picks flowers and she skips through the moonlit forest and you know she enjoys it she kind of revels in her moment of freedom but at the end, while she's tucked in bed, we see the wolf outside the window and the wolf essentially is saying, you know, um, you know, you, you made it through the forest this time. You were lucky to make it through the forest this time. But, you know, I only need to be lucky once to to catch you. So there's that sense that while there's a lot of joy and a lot of freedom and new adventures associated with growing up, there's also a lot of anxiety and a lot of vulnerability, and I think that's a really interesting ambivalence. And the thing that you have to smash the boundaries, you have to make into the forest in order to overcome that fear. In order Absolutely. To yourself from, that is very interesting as well. And I was wondering, do we have any more questions from the audience? I think, I think there was one for Jeanette that just popped up there somewhere. From Ernesto. So Ernest, we have a question for from Ernesto, right? I'm sorry, you can ignore it if there's another question. But uh, yeah, if there is someone. Um, yeah. Is there this vulnerability in phone home for Jenna? Thinking of the canonical yeah. strength of the comic and relatively, uh, relatively a quick time. In relatively a quick time, sorry. In terms of a, a vulnerability of, of um, growing up. Yeah, or of the of the character of the nar narrator's voice mm -hmm. and and the female characters uh, in the story and yeah is, is, is yeah whatever yeah do you think yeah absolutely it's um it's absolutely a coming of age um, narrative and one that is fraught with quite a lot of anxiety um. And uh, the the image that I said is the kind of inspiration for the Ring of Keys song in in the, in the graphic novel is um, much more anxious. Uh, so you see her framed looking, and then that is immediately kind of quashed where her father asks her, "Is that what you want to look like?" And I think the caption contradicts what she says. So the caption says something like, "You know, I think I wanted to look like," but she says no. <laughs> The, to the her father so that sense in which she's she's very much constrained in that her space and then you see it becoming freer as she leaves the home space um and then it becomes constrained again by um by the death of her father and by the, the kind of strictures of the university as well so you get all these images of her kind of surrounded by male professors telling her what to read in in certain books and her kind of saying she's being suffocated and things so as that kind of freedom is 
in one area, it's it's being squashed in other areas. So it is it is a, a thing that's absolutely fraught with those kind of anxieties of finding the self and and leaving behind the, the kind of child self and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Janet. I think we have suddenly uh, reached three minutes to five. <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to share, uh, Janet and Miranda, Paola, before we wrap up? Uh, nothing, nothing big. I just, I did notice that someone did ask in the in the chat oh. about the, the the relationship, and I'll do it really quickly because we have like very little time. But someone did ask in the chat about the relationship between Carol's story, "A Lady's Hands Are Cold," and um, and Angela Carter's "The Bloody Chamber," and it's really interesting because I read an interview with Carol a while ago where she said, in fact, she hadn't read Angela Carter before writing the story, but had come to her later. And I found that really interesting because separately, both of these women then are reworking the, the traditional fairy tale of Bluebeard, which is one of my favorite fairy tales because it's just so gruesome. But it's fascinating how both of these women are reworking this fairy tale and using it as a way to explore violence against women and, you know, sort of anxiety about um the power imbalance in you know in heteronormative relationships so i think it, it's fascinating that you know both of these authors one in the 70s and one in the 2010s sort of came to bluebeard separately and used it as a way of exploring um exploring those anxieties so i just wanted to, to address that really quickly Ooh, and someone recommended another book to me as well which sounds awesome um so thank you for that in the collection hag as well oh, hag. oh that looks awesome yes okay i i, I got it i'll get into that now. okay so, thank you <laughs> thanks very much it's good to see kira here as well from ubiquity press thank you for mm -hmm. coming kira and thank you everyone for coming today hopefully this will be the first one of a of a series of other webinars thank you so much miranda thank you so much thank Jeanette. you thank you all for thank you guys for inviting us and for everyone who came as well like for all the questions and everything was fantastic thank you and paula as always thank you so much you're welcome and thank you all for accepting to participate in this with I organized yeah, Ernesto Priego, the first session of many, hopefully. Yeah, I will see you soon. Uh, take care, everyone. Uh, these are difficult times, so it's great that we are able to meet at least in. Uh, so lots of love and uh, keep an eye on at Comics Grid on Twitter, and um, we will uh, organize an event soon.